Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, this is Lily Gorin with the New Books Network, the New Books and Political Science podcast. Today I'm joined by Terry Givens, who's one of three authors who wrote Immigration in the 21st Century, the Comparative Politics of Immigration Policy. Terry wrote this with Rachel, Rachel Navarre and Pete Mohanty. Sorry about that, Pete. Um, and this is published by Rutledge Press in 2020. Um, Terry is here to talk to me about the book. I'd love to welcome her to the New Books and Political Science podcast, ask her to tell us a little bit about herself and how she and her co-authors came to this project. Hi, Terry. Hi, it's so wonderful to be here. And this has been a project I've been wanting to do for a long time. <laughs> so, and actually it got a bit delayed because I had these kind of side gigs as being a provost and stuff like that, you know. But anyway, um, you know, when I started studying the politics of immigration, uh, gosh, 25 years ago, I guess, um, I, I realized that there, you know, there weren't very many political scientists studying it at the time. Um, and I was very lucky to be at uh, UT Austin with Gary Freeman. Um, and then I had a bunch of other mentors like Jim Hollifield and Marty Shane and, and others. And um, you know, they did some really important work back in the late 1990s. Actually, Gary's work goes back to the 1980s, along with people like Mark Miller and, and others. Um, but there wasn't really anything definitive. So when I was start, I, I started teaching a class um, on comparative immigration politics, I had to pull stuff together. And so I have to give a shout out to Dan Tishner, one of my favorite people in political science, because his book Old was friend. just... Yeah, his book was like the, the cornerstone of my course for the last 20 years. Um, but then I read and then I, you know, I, I tried to convince him and another colleague to go in with me on doing a, a textbook, but I could never pin him down. So I said, OK, finally, I have to do this myself. And um, so what I'd used. In, so I'd actually done an edited volume with David Leal and Gary Freeman that was kind of you know, uh, it was about immigration politics and security. And so that was another book I used over the years. And then um, I also would use uh, the controlling immigration book that Jim Hollifield and others have been editing for years next to getting ready to come out with another version of it. Um, so there were, there were things out there, but there was nothing that really pulled the different strands of, of it together. And, you know, and from the be my beginning in comparative politics, I'll always remember George Sabellis was just like, you can't just do country by country. You have to do it by by topic. And I was like, oh, George, you know, it's so much easier to just say, OK, here's a chapter on Britain and here's a chapter on France. And it's like, no, you can't do that anymore. So this book was was destined to be the book that, first of all, did something very different by bringing in the U.S. as a case and Canada um, and Austria, you know, so not just focusing on, um, you know, the typical European countries, but actually saying we're going to look at, you know, a broader set of cases and include because I always started my course, like I said, with Dan's book, um, where we would study, you know, in depth, uh, you know, US immigration policy, and then we'd switch to the comparative cases. Um, so this book that I've written now with Pete and Rachel has allowed me to teach it the way I've always wanted to teach it. <laughs> so um, really integrating the US case with the other cases and comparing citizenship policy and, and all of that. So, so this is, you know, this is, it's funny because up until a few weeks ago, I guess I was like, this is my last gift to political science, but I guess I'm going to be continuing now that I'm I just announced that I'm going to be going to McGill this fall. <laughs> so I'm back yeah, in the Terry, game. <laughs> I don't think you're stopped giving gifts to political science these days. So, uh, which I appreciate. Um, I learned much from you. Um, Immigration in the 21st Century is a really great small book. It's not a huge 300, 400 page tome. Um, and it really does sort of, as you note, sort of do this different comparative perspective, which I really found useful. And I can see how this would be great in a, in a um, classroom um, as part of a course on immigration or public policy um, or comparative politics. And so just to get sort of the reader um, an understanding of the way that you've talked about this, as you say, you sort of brought in the United States, Canada, and Australia 
as a group of countries, thus a mm -hmm. kind of case study together that looks at, as you noted, kind of settler countries. Mm -hmm. um, and they are in comparison with two other groupings of countries. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about the way that you not only looked at the countries themselves, but these overarching groupings um, and, and how they sort of are the, ba the basis for the book. Absolutely, because it was important to me to understand that there's very different approaches to immigration, right? I mean, you can't just say, it, it, oh, we all look at visas the same way or, you know, so the, the, the issue is that, you know, the US, Canada, Australia have been, very much been, you know, countries that have been dealing with immigration since they were before they were founded, right? And whereas, um, and it's not that immigration wasn't happening in European countries, but there's kind of, you can, you know, in my study of this stuff over the years, there was kind of these different time frames that you had to look at. So, you know, the U.S., Canada, Australia, obviously since, you know, the 1700s, um, but for, you know, and keep in mind that, you know, some of these countries weren't even countries in Europe. So you can't really talk about borders and stuff before really, and, and things changed so much with World War One and then World War II. So I really try to focus on World War II, the post-World War II era, um, with the European countries. And then there's also kind of, so there's, although with, you know, Germany and France, we can talk about some of the, you know, uh, migration before the World War II, but for the most part, we're really focusing on the post-World War II era. And so there's kind of the, that, this set of countries who were kind of those guest worker countries where people were coming from Turkey and, and the other parts of Europe and so on. And, you know, that's, so it's really about how policies developed, right? How did we get to these policies we are at today? And, you know, and then of course, there's the link to the colonial uh, possessions that these countries had, you know, and that's impacted the UK, France, and Germany, obviously. Um, and, you know, I, I've, you know, have been following what's going on with things like the Windrush generation and so on. And one thing I don't want to forget to mention is I, especially now that I'm going to be teaching this class is I have a website uh, that's connected to my terrygivens.com and then you just go to the immigration and I'm going to be updating that with new texts that the recommended text. Um, I'll be doing more of a blog that, um, you know, has the latest news and how I'm using it in the classroom. But anyway, um, the, so then there's a, another set of countries that are kind of the newer. So there's new countries of immigration, which are like France, you know, Germany, UK, and the newer <laughs> countries of immigration. Um, and, and so uh, there, there's a whole set of countries like Italy and, and Spain and others that have been uh, more recently dealing with immigration flows and re especially refugee flows. And so we also have to, you know, we, we didn't get too much into the refugee issue because it just going to blow up on us too much. And, and I'll probably include some things in, in, um, on my website where people, if they like want to add that material to their class, I'll, I'll post some articles and things, but, um, you know, we didn't, the, and the reason it's such a short tome is, you know, like I said, I, I designed this the way I like to teach. <laughs> so, you know, you want to have the, the students, you know, you read a chapter and then you throw in some, you know, current events and, and you know, interesting articles. And then um, you may have a whole other book you use. And so this book allows you to kind of get into the topic, understand the basics, and then you can expand to more in-depth uh, articles and, and, you know, what's the latest in the news um, so that students don't aren't having to read, you know, 100 pages a week to, you know, before they kind of get to the, the meat. And, and that's the other thing I want to mention is that I want students to understand immigration from a very practical perspective, right? What, what do they really need to know? And, you know, to, to get a sense of the complexities of immigration. So the first thing I say on the day of class is, all I want you to come out of this really with is how complex the issue of immigration is. It's not just about the border. It's not just about, you know, saying we're going to, you know, shut the borders. It's, you know, and there's no such thing as somebody who believes in open borders. <laughs> I mean, they may exist, but from a political science perspective, they might as well not exist. So, um, And so you've talked a little bit, and I, I just want you to dig in a little bit more in terms of these, these three sort of groupings. Um, and as I was reading this, particularly um, on the, the post-war immigration, I, I had the 
honor to spend a little time in um, Bonn, Germany, a couple of springs ago on a Fulbright. And I was amazed by how much gelato the Germans are all walking around eating like all the time. And I, you know, had no idea. You sort of learn things about German food and cuisine and stuff like that. And I talked to my students and they're just like, oh, yeah, it was all the Italian guest workers who yeah. came after the war who set up all the gelato stands that we eat because we didn't really have ice cream before that. Right. Yeah. And it's not just that they have, you know, we- a spaghetti night because, you know, they would go to the Italian restaurant that the guest worker had opened. But it's not just that, but the kebab and, and you know, the Turkish uh, food. And um, so, yeah, I mean, if you, Germany is one of my favorite cases. And, and partly, you know, one thing Ron Rogowski told me when I was a grad student at UCLA is study Germany because and learn German because all the money is there. So if you're an American researcher and you take you learn German and you want to go do research in Germany, you will always have funding. And that has been absolutely true throughout my career. I spent more time in Germany than I have in France, even though France was my first language I learned in high school and college. I learned German um, and I've, I've spent, you know, so much more time in Germany. And I have friends in Germany who say, come and do this conference and you know, all that. So, um, and they'll probably be starting to happen again once the world opens up. I'm you know, keeping my uh, hopes up for that. But to come back to those, you know, people don't understand often, you know, they think, oh, Germany, you know, it's very homogenous. No way. I mean, since maybe, you know, they had millions of refugees and, and, and coming in first, and then they had um, all these guest workers they had to bring in because, you know, after World War II, the country was devastated. They'd lost all this manpower, you know, unfortunately, was, you know, just devastated as a country. And, you know, they talk about the Wirtschaft when they're the, the, you know, economic miracle that happened. And it was fueled by immigrants. And they started in Italy, but then um, they, you know, and Southern Europe, but, you know, especially when, you know, and this was very much impacted by the Cold War because a lot of uh, Eastern Europeans, there'd been a history of Eastern Europeans coming and doing seasonal work. And actually that's picked up again. So now along the Polish border, um, you know, you, you get a lot of uh, Polish workers still coming and doing seasonal work, as well as you may have heard the, of the Polish plumbers. <laughs> Particularly <laughs> in England, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but um they were all over Europe. Um, but uh, yeah, so Italy and then, you know, Turkey and, um, you know, that's where the the big surge of, of Turkish workers came. And then because of the economic um, slowdown in the late 60s and also the cutting off of immigration, they decided to stay. <laughs> so all of a sudden you had these people who had been um, thinking they were temporary. And then they had the, the, you know, there's the judicial component where the judges said, okay, you know, you're a permanent resident. Now you have the right to bring your family. So family reunification was a big driver of immigration after uh, the 1960s. And so there's this interesting development of kind of get from guest workers to, um, you know, permanent residents to citizens. And then of course, the citizenship question has come up you know, didn't really become a big issue until the late 1990s when um, they opened up their citizenship policy. And, and, you know, for France, they've just gone back and forth on their citizenship policy, but um, a lot of similarities. So this is, so you have the settler countries like the United States and Canada and Australia, and then you have the post-war immigration and you concentrate in the book mostly on Germany and France, Mm -hmm. um, where you also need the workers coming from other countries to help in the rebuilding after the destruction in World War II. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you have this third grouping that you talked about a little bit that you mostly focus on in the book on Spain and Italy Mm -hmm. as a sort of globalizing countries. Can you explain a little bit more about that sort of context and the sort of the time frame around that? Well, the time frame really is so. If you remember, um, Spain, you know, didn't even become a democracy until the seventies, right? And so um, they were pretty much closed off. Um, Italy just has, uh, for uh, with apologies to my Italian friends, but Italy has just been kind of a basket case in the EU, um, and so. 
people would go, they were transit countries, even kind of in the night, the mid 1990s, when there was this big surge of refugees, especially coming because of Kosovo and, and all of that. Um, they were transit countries where people were going through and to a certain extent, they still are because a lot of, especially coming from Africa, a lot of refugees and, and um, asylum seekers and even economic immigrants um, will go through these countries to get to France and then the UK. So, you know, but what we're seeing now is that, um, you know, more and more of them are staying. And so I've, you know, I've been to Italy and seen, you know, the, the immigrants there who are coming from North Africa and so on. And then in Spain, similar thing. And part of it has to do with, you know, um, the, uh, you know, basically the, um, the Mediterranean version of coyotes <laughs> um, taking people from Africa, North Africa to um, Spain and Italy. And of course, Greece has received a huge, we, we don't talk much about Greece, but Greece has had a huge influx of refugees. And partly this has to do, this is connected a lot to the EU and EU policies that have developed. So, you know, there was a time period um, in the early 1990s, no, or sorry, early 2000s, um, where one of my students, Adam Lutke, and I did a series of articles on EU immigration policy and how the EU was trying to do more on this front. And so they created these policies about things like third country nationals having to stay in the first country that they stopped in. And so that meant that a lot of people would Go, get to Italy and Spain and hoping that they could move on, but they were stuck <laughs> in Italy and Spain. And, and so these are the, the sort of, as you, you parse them out in the book, the immigrate, immigration flows right. um, in terms of different approaches in different countries um, with different sort of historical traditions and different, to some degree, perhaps slightly different concepts of citizenship as well yeah. as you sort of note in the book there's questions about language um, yeah. and questions about nation nationalism um, but you also talk about immigration broadly as a part of nation building yes um, and you know for political scientists you know it's a term we use a lot <laughs> nation building um, as, as opposed to democratization also um, but can you explain how this quest, this complex question of immigration sort of fits into the concept of nation building? Well, it has, first of all, you have to, if you're going to talk nation building, you have to talk sovereignty. And so the, you know, one of the first things I talk about when I teach this class is, you know, explaining to students what sovereignty means and that, you know, basically who you let into your country is one of the ultimate expressions of sovereignty. And that this idea of maintaining borders and so on. And you know, I get frustrated with people who seem to think that, oh, we're just gonna eventually have this free-flowing citizenship and you know, cosmopolitanism. And he's like, no, you know, national the reason nationalism and populism is on the rise is because you know, we kind of have these shifts, swings back and forth. But anyway, in terms of nation building. You know, immigration is both a can be a positive. So you look at a country like Can U.S. and Canada, especially in the early, you know, immigration was the way we created our nation, um, unless you count the slaves and indigenous people and all that. But, you know, <laughs> for those who don't know, I am African-American. And um, so I, I, I can joke about that. But um, <laughs> in any case, I mean, you but you can't un under you know, you sh I, I don't want to you know, say that those aren't important things. It's just, uh, since I am talking about immigration and not like forced enslavement, <laughs> um, I focus on immigration. Um, and uh, so there, to, you know, there were countries that still continue to rely on immigration for nation building. Um, and Canada for sure is one of those. The U.S. is kind of in this phase of, actually since the 1920s, to be fair, the U.S. You know, kind of was in this immigration shutdown and didn't really open up again until the 1960s. Um, but that, it, you know, that the idea of nation building is really complex and comes into who we are as a nation. And that's why so many, you saw this in the early 2000s, so many countries saying, what does it mean to be French? What does it mean to be German? What does it mean to be American? You know, the America, uh, you know, the language issues that came up. So, you know, we talk about the um, fact that, you know, there were all these bills across the U.S. To, that called for English language as the um, official language, because we don't, 
we don't have an official language here in the U.S., um, but other countries, because of linguistic differences um, and groups like in France, you have uh, Breton and, and other languages that people are trying to preserve have had to, you know, specify things like, you know, uh, official languages and, and so on. And, you know, Germany's, um, you know, citizenship policy was revolved around nation building, right? Going back to Bismarck and the creation of the German state and, you know, what, you know, basically you had to be German by blood, you know, use sanguinis, and they only came to the idea of having use solely in, in the late 1990s. So nation building is intertwined with immigration, with who you let into the country, with citizenship and who can be a citizen. And that, you know, for Germany, that was just such a huge issue. You know, this idea of, can we as a nation have people who are not German, you know, become Germans? And that's still a big question, right? They, I don't think they've resolved that yet, um, even though people are getting German citizenship, but, you know, there was a reluctance by a lot of Turks to get German citizenship um, for a variety of reasons, but um, in any case. And, and I, I, you know, and I, we, we, I remember seeing this sort of conversation also when there were a number of riots in, in outside of Paris, mm -hmm. um, some years back, because the people who were protesting, who were unemployed for the most part, but were French citizens, That's right. um, but they were black in color. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so there was a lot of discussion about what it meant to be French, Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, again, we, uh, at the United States like to say we're a nation of immigrants, but again, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean to be an American citizen? Mm -hmm. Um, which is, is part of the complexity that you all get into in your book. I wanted to talk a little bit to you about, um, you come at this also about the sort of idea of immigration studies mm -hmm. as something that's fairly new, um, within disciplines like political science and sociology. Um, can you explain a little bit about the study mm -hmm. of immigration and migration um, and the fact that those terms and concepts are in fact distinct? Yeah, and part of the reason for that is it's almost like the difference between comparative and IR, right? It's like immigration is in the realm of the comparativist because we tend to focus more on domestic politics and migration is in the realm of the IR folks. So it's funny because one of my very good friends, Jeanette Money, and I, we met when I was still a grad student and we you know, obviously we've worked together on various things over the years. And, you know, it's funny because she's an IR and I'm a comparative and same, you know, Jim Hollifield is more IR and I'm, you know, so it's really interesting to see the different approaches we take to these, these topics. And yet there's a lot of overlap. So I don't want to try to say, OK, well, you can you can't talk about migration if you're a comparativist and if you're an IR person, you can't talk about immigration. I mean, it's it's more that, um, you know, the things we look at in terms, you know, like um, for you know Jim Hollifield is, is very well known for his you know kind of liberal state hypothesis, which basically says that liberal states are going to have a hard time controlling migration. Um, and yet, you know, for me, I was more interested in who are the immigrants and what's happening to them in terms of policy and what are the citizens. So there's, you know, there's these different arenas that we play in within political science. But, you know, my frustration um, early on in my career was that, like I said, there just weren't very many people studying this. And I couldn't quite understand why. Um, and even though you know, actually, I think sociology got onto this much earlier than we did. And, um, but I, I think it just has to do with who studies political science. And I'm delving into this topic more in my next book on the roots of racism, because, you know, you I, I, I can't talk about this without mentioning Jessica Priest's book, um, because, you know, the, the who studies immigration tends to determine how we study Im and, not, and not even you know, immigration, who studies political science has everything to do with the things we study. So for example, you know, um, it's, it's just mind blowing to me that we didn't start including uh, uh, that our, our, you know, first of all, it took a long time for surveys to include African-Americans or black people. It's only in the last like 10, 15 years that we started including Latino, Latinx, you know, Hispanic people. And then, you know, Karthik Ramakrishnan and his group are, are the first to start looking at Asian Americans. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, really? I mean, 
political behavior, uh, you know, I mean, all these things. So anyway, I could go on and on about that. But political science has not been a very good discipline in terms of really looking at the broad array of issues and and how they affect different groups and and so on. And I think that's just it's changing and it needs to change more rapidly. Um, but, I, you know, it. it it's interesting because we tried to create a section in APSA like in the late 1990s, Jeanette Money kind of led the way and we couldn't get enough people. <laughs> and now it's, you know, this very vibrant, I'm so glad the, the, the younger generation has taken this on and has the APSA section. I guess I'm going to have to get, I was kind of out of it the last few years, but I have to get back into it. Um, but, um, you know, our, 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 it's just important to understand that certain things are studied because of who is studying them. And I believe that race and, you know, things like immigration are inextricably bound with every aspect of our politics and policy. And we have to acknowledge that as a discipline. And I'm so glad Paula McLean, as our APSA president this year, has been highlighting that. And I'll be, I'm highlighting it in my next book and that we, you cannot extricate um, race and you know, immigration status and, you where people are from from our politics yeah i mean it's also the norming of who is the norm right, right? exactly and 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 so what is the deviation then who who is the deviation from that mm -hmm. um as we sort of talk about it um and so you you gave me a little bit to, of the immigration versus migration, migration. within <laughs> the comparison between comparative politics and ir but the terms themselves as you talk about in the book the the terms themselves used to be sort of interchangeable but mm -hmm. now we use them very much more precisely. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about the terms, those two terms, and, and how they've sort of, again, moved into this sort of scope, their own scopes? Right. Yeah, because, you know, like looking at migration really is this broader, you know, where, where are the flows? Where are they coming from? Why? You know, things like climate change and migration are a big topic right now. And, um, you know, what are, you know, conflict obviously has been a big component of this, whereas immigration is really, like I said, you know, looking at the, the domestic politics. It's like looking at policy. It's looking at, you um, who are the people and why are they? I mean, it's not that you're excluding that the, that migration component because you are looking at who are the people and why are they coming. I mean, obviously, colonialism has a huge impact on immigration as well as migration, but it's really kind of targeting where what are you looking at, and um, you know, and to you know, I'm gonna um, you know talk about. The, you know, what I put in the book, you know, because I have this whole section on what is immigration versus migration. And so immigration, as I say, is the action of coming to live permanently in a foreign country. And migration is the movement of people to a new area or country in, in order to find work. But um, we tend to look at people who are moving from one country to another as, as and have the potential to become settlers and, as immigrants versus people who are moving to another region or, or area. And, and, and it's just about them. That's about the broader movement of people, right? So that's why things like conflict can cause people to move that they're migrants because of the conflict. They are not immigrants in the sense that they're going to, they're looking to go somewhere to be settlers. Um, but then it, it still gets a little confused when you have asylum seekers and refugees, right? So, but we, t we tend in, in the study to, separate out asylum seekers and refugees, but that's becoming more difficult to do. So I think, you know, it, it, even though I try it to, to make this distinction, I think as time goes on, we're going to have a harder and harder time with that because be, particularly because climate change is creating so many more refugees. So people are looking to leave and become permanent settlers, you know, be, but be, it's because of conflict, which is being fueled by climate change and, and all these things. So although I, I do my best to try and make that distinction because in political science, like I said, you've got this, this broader distinction. I think, um, I do think it's also important though to, to, to maintain those connections and collaborations between those who, who focus more on migration, i.e. the flows of people versus immigration, you know, settlers and, and what's happening to them. 
And and following up on that, uh, in terms of the flows, because you say this um, in the concluding chapter, one of the things you point out is that there are lots of trade packs that govern the flow of goods, mm-hmm. um, and and we have lots of those. We you know we have NAFTA, and we have the NAFTA 2.0 or whatever, and the EU, yes, and all, yeah. you know, and we had the the Suez Canal incident just recently, um, yes. and and but you as you know there are far fewer Mm -hmm. um, treaties or governing mechanisms for the flow of people. That's right. Um, Can you explain perhaps why that is the case? Yes. It's, it's interesting because I I did a a chapter for Tanya Bozel and Thomas Lissa in one of their regionalism books on regional uh, agreements on uh, immigration or migration. And um, you know, it's really interesting that that has not been, you know, even though, so for example, first NAFTA, um, there were some components of it that addressed, uh, you know, labor and, and labor flows, but there's been a huge hesitancy to do anything really concrete in these types of agreements. And I think it comes back to what we were talking about earlier around sovereignty, right? This is a one area where I think nation states feel like they have to maintain their sovereignty, which is why I'm, I just don't believe that we'll ever, at least not in my lifetime, get to a point where we have a more open kind of citizenship and, and a regime where people can move around more easily. Um, you know, the EU is regressing on that, right? <laughs> um, unfortunately, and I've, I've been worried about, uh, you know, kind of that Schengen area for a long time, because I could see the kind of the little tiny steps of regression on that. And then Brexit just blew it up. Um, the combination of Brexit and COVID. And I mean, you couldn't imagine a more perfect storm for, um, for the free movement of people in Europe, which is, you know, first of all, you know, just the, the financial crisis and then, you know, the Brexit and then COVID. I mean, just three things. So um, in any case, to come back to, you know, that question, it has to do a lot with just this idea of being able to maintain border because your borders are what create your country. And if you can't control your borders and say who can and can't come, then, um, you know, we, we, what's the point? And like I said, you, we're going through these waves of nationalism. And right now, you know, at least in the last few years, we've been in a very kind of nationalistic mode, not just here. I mean, and what's been fascinating is it's been around the globe. You know, you can look at the Philippines and, you know, many Asian countries. And I mean, it, it's just everywhere. This kind of wave of, of nationalism has been just stunning to me. Um, And so I think that's a a big part of it is this need to maintain these national borders and this need to, to maintain an identity. And that's where, you know, we, we could have a whole nother hour long discussion just about the the identity component of this. Um, But I think that's what's coming. It's coming down to is this, we want our nation, we want to have our identity. And to do that, we have to cut back on, um, you know, the flows of people who are turning us into something we don't recognize. And, you know, this is the constant refrain right now in the United States. Absolutely. Right. 100% is, yeah. um, you know, well, if we let in more people, we won't be Americans anymore. That's right. um, and, and, you know, I, I was just reading an, an op-ed before I got on the call with you um, that apparently some, one of the one of the people on Fox was just saying that last night, mm-hmm. um, yeah. almost exactly those words. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, it is this complication in terms of, as you say, immigration is never simple and it does include the complexities of things like what do you, what is your nation mm-hmm. and how do you define it? And, mm-hmm. you know, do you have water all around you, like maybe Japan or mm-hmm. parts of the United States? Or, mm-hmm. you know, are you landlocked and have transit of yes. people? Um, I remember hearing Luck Valesa give a talk one time and he said, about how Poland was the way that Russia got to visit its friends. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my Germany and, and, and Russia would visit each other yes, through Poland. 
Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. One of the first things I do when I teach my Western European politics classes, I go back to like the. So there's this great um, uh, video on YouTube about that shows how the borders of Europe have changed, like since the 1200s up to the present. And you know, most of my students don't realize most of these countries didn't exist 100 years ago. <laughs> hundred years ago, you know? <laughs> so anyway, it's, yes. it's interesting. As, mm-hmm. as, as, as Eddie Izzard says, you know, you, you get a flag, you put it down. Now I'm here. This is my country. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make fun of colonialism and the problems that it had and imperialism, but yeah, there's, there, there isn't anything written in stone, Mm-mm. um, in terms of where your country starts and stops. Right. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the conflicts we're dealing with today, like Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran, are because of those darn British going and saying, these are going to be your borders now. <laughs> and we're going to help you with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Until we decide we won't. <laughs> So we're, it, we're talking about this sort of question of identity, but I think that your next book is yes. somewhat focused on that. So it why is. don't you tell me a little bit about what you're working on now? So uh, my next book, so I, before I do that, I want to mention the intervening book, which is um, Radical Empathy, Finding a Path to Bridging Racial Divides, which we will talk about another time. But um, that book was really more of a memoir um, that's kind of combines memoir and data to discuss why we have such very important divides in this country, but how we can get past them. Um, But the next book is about the roots of racism, and that should be out by the end of the year, I'm hoping. And what I wanted to do in this book is pull together the research that talks about how did we get to where we are today on race? And it's not just a U.S. issue, it's, it's a global issue, although I focus on the transatlantic component. And really looking back at, you know, le- using the research of some great folks like Bob Vitalis and Jessica Priest, you know, it's like I have a whole chapter just talking about political science and, and race and how race has kind of gone in and out of fashion. Um, but at the influences of Europeans and how Europe really was the, the focal point of where, you know, the whole idea of race came from in the beginning and then how that be- has become over the time totally intertwined. So, you know, and part of this came out of my own research uh, back in, you know, the early 2000s on the radical right and Islamophobia and, you know, how, you know, you have very recently politicians from the U.S., you know, working with far-right politicians in Europe and, you know, funding going back and forth and, and things like this. So, you know, I was like, well, wait a second, this isn't just a U.S. issue or a Europe issue. It's, it's, working together. So I, I, again, I take a, a, a approach that um, I, George, I blame um, George Sabellas a kind of topic focused approach to look at, you know, wait, like, so there's a great book by Kathy Lisa Schneider about uh, police riots and, and, you know, more of a comparative approach, US, Europe, and really looking at research like that, that helps us understand these ongoing linkages and how race remains a very important component of policymaking um, and the rise of, you know, people like Donald Trump and, and Boris Johnson and, you know, even Silvio Berlusconi and, and things like that. Um, so. Well, I hope I, I look forward to talking to you about the book Radical Empathy, but mm-hmm. also to talking to you later about the book, The Roots of Racism. Both of them sound really fascinating and yes. um, important. Yeah, I like uh, to pretend that I kind of got <laughs> snuck away from academia, but the reality yeah. is I've been working on it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to thank Terry Givens for joining me today to talk about the book that she co-authored with Rachel Navarre and Pete Mohanty. Um, And it is Immigration in the 21st Century, the Comparative Politics of Immigration Policy. And this is from Rutledge Press, published in 2020, available at Rutledge Press, I assume, Um, and any place else one wants to buy books. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you so much for joining me today, Terry. Oh, it was my pleasure. I really enjoyed the discussion. Thanks.